Hi everybody, thanks for coming back. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, what I do with my watercolors. Um, I have um, several palettes that I have going all the time. Sometimes I'll make up a new palette even for a particular artwork that I might be working on at the time. Um, you know, if it's if I'm going to be working with a limited palette, then I'll have one of my smaller. I, I do. I work a lot with porcelain palettes in that. I really like. You can get these. Oh, you can go to any uh, kitchen store or whatever. But get make sure it's porcelain because it doesn't stain when you're using any of your staining colors. Um, you know, I have two very bright lights focused on here, and yet this webcam still makes this look all shadowy. It's crazy. Uh, it is so bright looking at this paper and everything right now. But anyway, uh, so I will I will have several palettes on the go. Um, because I'm not able to um, videotape at my studio right now, I'm forced to be at home. I've got my little computer table here, and I've got um, a little um, gooseneck apparatus up here holding my webcam so bear with me but um, this is an old palette I mean this here palette I it's got to be 30 years old or more I've had it and but with all my palettes regardless big or small I always make up a little color sheet you know of all that obviously these um, here were empty at the time, but I, I've over the years I've probably put put uh, removed some color and added more because these are this one here's got a couple of different shades of blue in it, so I've probably you know the new favorite blue whatever had gone there, so that's why these were kept empty because they were empty for the longest time. I have my darker tones here because this was primarily the palette. I, this side of the palette was what I used. Um, this whole side here, the darker side, was when I was painting my drifting saints. The dark ruddy features of uh, anyway so you know this being here here sometimes I put the colors in this is so old though I don't know why I didn't put the colors in because on all my big palettes I've got it whether it's Whit Winsor Newton I've even put pigment numbers on it so I'm not really sure where my head was at but I mean like I said this is old and actually so it just goes to show you the quality of the paints because um, even after all these years I, I don't believe that I don't think I did this 30 years ago, but this I've done this quite a while ago, but I don't believe it's 30 years old. But nevertheless, um, a little scuffed up and whatever as it is, it, the light fastness. Look at how vivid those lights or those those paints still are. Okay, so that's my oldie goldie. These are always designed, you know, for uh, for uh, for you put your hand in for if you were going to do a plein air and. For me, this works perfect because being a lefty, it was easy for me too. Although you can see I cheated and actually even used some um, dreaded acrylics in my watercolor palette of the day. But that's an oldie. These are all stains and acrylic. But anyway, I love it anyway. It's hard to get rid of the goldies. But this one here I've had for probably about eight years now. Um, yeah, maybe less. But so again, this is a really nice palette too because it has this plastic lid that comes off and then of course I, I always have a lot of blues this isn't quite cleaned out because I just finished um, doing a project for a, a school project um, for um, you know stay for those that are at home where I'm working on a community project anyway so these colors are still wet in there but I typically try to clean out all of this this is kind of like an always an always clean or always dirty I want to try out something, some color that isn't on here, which most of the time I'm pretty okay. But you can see how many blues I carry in my palette because I do like to mix my own greens. You don't see any greens on my palette at all. Now, I do like, um, this is a olive green and that's a green gold. I love green gold. I love leaf green by Whole Bean. I do use those. But primarily, though, I can usually get those colors, and I'll show you in a minute. So that's kind of what I do with my watercolors as soon as I get them to, regardless of a palette I may have. And then that I just set this in here, and then I, this just pops right back on. Actually, it fits in this way, and that kind of holds it in place and keeps it dry. So that's my, my um, modern 
and I use this at home and, and travel. Um, I do have uh, several other palettes, but I, I have a handful of brushes that I keep at home as well. But what I wanted to show you what I also do. Um, I just got caught up really on some of the paint because of being at home and I finally get to do the wish list. But these are these are something that I always do and always done and I, I, I update them as necessary, but they almost look like paint chips, don't they? But these are these are what I own. These are the watercolors that I own. And so, and also you see how I've got them put together. I have um, one of those old fashioned paper punches, you know, nice little hole punch. And then you can buy these D rings separately. And then I just put them on the D ring and then I can hang them up. And they're really, really super handy. If I want to know, you know, if I'm in particular, particular yellow I'm looking for. Um, I also do, like, I just don't do these. These are just for individual colors. But what I do with, so like, for instance, this palette here, I don't have it here, which I probably should because this palette's here all the time. I actually make a color grid of all the colors I have on my palette and then what they look like when they're mixed with each other so that if I was looking for a particular color, I just look on the chart and I go, oh, okay, that was, you know, pyro scarlet red with the Hansa yellow light to make that particular orange, say. So um, doing color grids is very important. I uh, highly recommend it. And I usually uh, talk about that when I'm teaching. But I think that these are very important too. Like I have um, primarily Winsor Newton and Daniel Smith. Now I do have um, a handful of whole beans as well. There's the leaf gold right there. Um, and so, and you can also see I also own greens, right? But I don't have them in my palette. So every now and again though, I remember I have them. Now, on my big, big palette that I've had for years, I do, and I, no, I didn't, I, it's, I don't anymore, but I did, I had Viridian Green. Viridian Green is kind of a green you really, it's really difficult to kind of mix yourself. It's a beautiful, translucent green. Um, it's a cool green, and um, it makes beautiful blacks. Um, and that's why I use the Viridian, because I make my own blacks, too. Now, that being said, I do own watercolor blocks because, you know, when you're a watercolorist, you tend to be a little bit of a hoarder, too. But anyway, there's my yellow palette, you know, right to the warms. These are the warms. There's the blues. Primary, I try to put them in like almost like a color wheel. But there's the blues. There's all my blues. Look at how many blues I have compared to. And those are all different blues. Look at that. So I got all three. So they're between Daniel Smith and Windsor. I actually have a couple of Grumbacher and some Koi's, but um, that's how I get to see how they either pretty much some of them are. Um, well, and the other thing too, um, Grumbacher Cobalt Blue Hue is ultramarine blue. It's pigment 29. How funny is that, eh? So even the Grumbacher all ultramarine is PB29, which is ultramarine blue, which is really silly. Anyway, so then these are some of your, you know, your want to have colors like Moon Glow, so you don't have to um, mix those colors yourself. But if you wanted to, I, you know, I always put the PB, the pigment um, code names on it, and you can see um, it's. I actually also too, thanks to one of my students now, a beautiful painter herself, uh, Michelle, she actually made a spreadsheet with all uh, with all the colors she had and I thought what a what a smart thing to do so that's what I did too so for that left brain side when you want to go look an actual chart and that way you can really put in all the information of your pigments especially if you're looking for a, a particular one anyway so this is uh, these are all my colors and then of course so those are extra reds that maybe got added on and, and then I just made these small these are all made from um, watercolor paper 140 pound you could probably do it with a 90 but they might bubble up even more because you're working with you know you pure pigment I'll show you how I did it actually and then you could do your own and of course the earth pigments these are my darks these are the darks neutrals and then a cure of course my cure these are the ones that I just added recently the kiritaki um, these are those beautiful um, golden metallic watercolors. So really what they are is they're a mica base. 
Now, um, how I got onto these is uh, somebody sent me a link to a, a video, a lady on, on YouTube, uh, which many will probably know. Her name is Cece, and I guess she uses a lot of these little gold, um, gold pigment paints. And it was a Kiritaki, so I ordered it. This was $5.55 on its own, and that was through Amazon. You could get it from their sites, but I think it's even more. And because I have Prime, I think I got the um, the shipping for free. But anyway, I thought, geez, you know, I wonder if they have any other colors or whatever. So I typed in Kiritaki metallic colors, and oh my gosh. So I, I'll, I'll talk about that, and I'll tell you about the prices. So anyway, so I ordered these two sets. They've gone up in price now, too, probably because of the popularity. Um, these here are also, you can probably see it a little bit better when I move it. You can see there's a sheen on the surface. These are actually Daniel Smith Extra Fine. I've had these for a very long time. They're more of a, you know, a, an opaque, um, tend to be more towards the whitish side, but they look really nice mixed with watercolors themselves to give a sheen. So if you wanted a green shimmer, um, you've got your uh, Daniel Smith Extra Fine Interference Green. And then if you want the blue, you've got the interference blue. So they they call, there's extra fine interference silver. So, and then there's the two pearlescents. So there's the extra fine pearlescent, um, which has got, is two whites, uh, W20 and W6. And um, pearlescent shimmer. So this one is almost more, uh, this one here is more translucent. Anyway, I also... Look at how vivid and brilliant these colors are. So this is the um, core watercolors. So I ordered a basic set. And there's your green gold in the core. Really, really super vivid colors. They actually take a little bit of getting used to because they're so strong. Their pigment is so bright. And the reason for that is, is they use a clear, um, a clear binder. And it's... Um, um, what is it now? It's core. Well, here, let me just see if I've got it handy. Yeah. Um, it's a, like an aqua. Oh, what is it called? Um, what's the binder? Anyway, I guess it does. I can always say it in another one, but um, it is a clear. It's clear as opposed to the gum Arabic. Um, that Windsor uses and Daniel Smith, uh, Sennelier. Um, actually, I'm getting some more watercolors in that I want to try from Japan. They use a honey. Um, they're a very primitive uh, way that they go about it. They they grind all the earth pigments themselves, and then apparently that it's cured for some time and or in these barrels with this honey so that it achieves its maximum uh, luminosity. So I'm going to give them a try anyway. Um, so one of the other things I like to do, so that's that, okay? But something that's really cool that I like to do, though, too, because I mix my own greens, that one's kind of more important to me because I, you know, you have your reds, you have your blues, and they're very stark, and you have your yellows. That's your primary. But when you're getting into some of the secondaries and you're mixing, which I mix more of my greens, then that's when I use, um, I will use every blue in my palette, with every yellow in my palette and I will make these swatches but what I'll also do too is like this one here is a little bit more organized the first one I ever did this one um, hang on here <laughs> this one here you can see they were just great big swatches but I've since um, in, enlarged um, these are just the, the greens themselves that I have Yeah. No, this is green gold. This is all of by itself. This is green gold, and this is green gold mixed with French ultramarine, manganese, thylo blue green shade, and thylo blue red shade, and this is Prussian. Anyway, so and then what I did is I ended up going through all, there we are, all my pigments. So this one is yellow ochre with all of them. You can see how dull and very muted because the yellow ochre is actually earth pigment, so it's very dull, and it will provide a lot of dull, kind of grayish greens. But these have their place. They've got their great colors. 
Um, I love the, the, the nice muted colors that yellow ochre gives. And then, of course, you've got your brighter greens. So that's going to be with your cooler. This is New Gamboge, though, which is a really nice uh, orangey yellow. And then it's mixed with all these, all the blues that I have on that, on this particular palette. Because um, I tend to carry this palette over into my big one now, too. Uh, since I lost all my um, Daniel Smiths, or they were taken, I, I'm, yeah, anyway, a huge, a very large um, box of my da large two Daniel Smiths went missing. And so I've had to kind of replenish my pink painting. I would have had those paints for very many years. But anyway, that's the greens. And something else I like to do too is I do, um, so I started doing this and I'm punching the holes in them. And um, like I had these cards at the studio anyway, and I have them in little folders. But um, since I, when I pulled out these, because I wanted to talk about these, I since went in and grabbed a bunch and I put the, poked the holes in them so that I could keep them all together, which is really, really smart, right? Because when you want to go back and reference much like I did did with even my, um, when I did it in my previous video with these, oopsie, see there goes the light, these here, I keep these all together. Well, I'm going to be punching holes in these and putting them on those as well. So I used to keep these in a little folder by themselves. And then of course I had these near my paints. So these are the new ones. Okay, this one. And then what I did with that is I kind of did some little doodles with this here uh, last October, made some little, uh, you know, doodle, you know, like kind of like almost like Zen tangles, I guess, on here. These are the most common ones that I do and repeat. So it's really nice to kind of see them um, done in this metallic, right? This is fun too, this one here. These are, these are kind of my signature flower. Whenever I do uh, send tangles, I do these flowers and I love these too. Look like little button, hairy buttons. Anyway, so, but look at this. So these are the Kiritakis and the uh, Kamrabi. I think it's Kamrabi or Kam... Komarabi. So what I do with this, you'll see here. So uh, all the pens that I like to use, here we go. All the pens that I keep forgetting to look at the camera to see what I'm doing. This one is done this way. Is you, you can see my writing. This tells you what what I used for my black. Black is a really good base, um, a really good black. If you want to see what the opacity of your watercolors are, this is a really good test strip. I do that with a lot of watercolors. I actually even have a chart of just all of those as well with all my watercolors going across um, the different blacks that I tend to use, um, especially if you're, you know, just so that you can see the opacity or the translucency. Some are semi. You can see that this one here, this one in particular, um, I probably should have wrote down, which won't be hard to do. I can write down the number of the, the metallic, but you can see with the, these are two Winsor Newton wa black watercolors, and you can see that it actually kind of activated the two watercolors just bringing my brush lightly over. Um, it wetted it out and it kind of started mingling. But these are the, the art pens that I typically use. This one's a Tombow. That's the Spectrum Noir. That's a Sharpie, a fine point. This is one of the brushes that I like to use. Um, uh, it's like brush ink. And this is pure India ink, which is very black, but it tends to have a little bit of a sheen. And I like using that actually with the metallics because it complements the metallics. But anyway, you can see just how yummy all those colors are. And those are all the colors, all 12 colors from. So what I did on this one is I actually um, used another black. So I had this is actually not really a black. It's a neutral which is um, tends to be on the cool side, then even though they call it a neutral. But um, it has a, I um, can't remember what the pigments are in there, PV19 and PB15. So it's on the blue and the violet side. So that's why it's considered a cool, even though it doesn't look it. But this is sepia, which I like to use a lot too. Sepia is a great color to have in your watercolor arsenal as well. But these here are the whites that I have. I don't 
No, I'm not going to say I don't use whites <laughs> because I never used to use whites. I always was a watercolor purist and said, oh, you have to use the white of the paper. But I have since gone to the gouache side. I There is a titanium um, watercolor here. This is the gouache and this is the Chinese white. Now the Chinese white is it's got a translucency to it and it's considered a cool white because it has zinc in it. The gouache and the titanium both have PW6 in them. So they, they're the same um, kind of um, a warm opaque white. However, I like the consistency of the gouache better. I don't have to water it down very much to use it because it's really got a really nice quality uh, thinness to it that squeezing out of the tube with the titanium white is very thick and then you, you have to add quite a bit of water to break it down and then sometimes it's too much water, blah, blah. But you can see here where the, um, the metallics actually started playing with the zinc underneath. So you, it's really cool to see and these are the spaces in between, but it's really cool to see the kind of um, effects that paints will have with one another. So if you want to add this into one of your paintings, I got to tell you, I'm so fascinated with these. I try to find every excuse I can to use these metallics lately. I'm just gobsmacked with them. But these here, of course, those are the, um, these here are the same pens with the Daniel Smith. Uh, I don't know if you can see, you see the blue and the, you can see the little bit of the blue and the green there. And then of course you've got this one that's barely trans, transparent, like it's just a shimmery. You can see the black quite a bit underneath. And then these are semi, right? So they're all pretty much semi, but cool, huh? So that's what I like to do. I'll, I'll even put like, um, you know, any kind of repeating. I was playing with this one here because of this um, um, connecting hearts program that I'm a part of right now. But anyway, I'll, I've got a few of these still even down at the studio where I make, these are kind of my re, my go-tos, uh, shapes that I use all the time when I'm doing cards um, or just doodle paints, you know, like, or, you know, but primarily they're like for cards, right? When if I'm going to make handmade cards or, or anything like that, my paintings are completely separate. This is another thing I do. I've kind of coined it my 20 minute muse. I will take watercolor paper. I will cut them all in even squares. So what I did with this one here though, is that this was a big paper. I think it was a nine by 12 watercolor paper. It was, um, it was a heavier though. It was a 200 pound. Um, and what I did is I actually mixed, um, gesso and ink together. And I played with it on the entire sheet, huge sheet, let it, because it's almost like watching oil and vinegar when you see the two of these play together. You want to get them, um, you want to get the gesso fairly liquidy, so fairly fluid. And, um, and then it will be uh, compatible with the fluidity of the India ink too. So way too much fun, I'll tell you. So then what I did is I cut them all up into these little squares. These, well, these are my... And then what I do is I take them along with me and then I, 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 I find shapes and faces and paint pictures in them. So this is my 20 minute muse. So for 20 minutes, so that's the time frame. 20 minutes is all it takes actually to get that right side of the brain kicked in too. So, but what I'll do is I'll sit here and I'll actually play with these and try to find uh, shapes and whatnot. The downside is, is I probably should have done both sides. It doesn't matter though. Look at this one here. It turned into being like, like a turkey. I was just a blob. You can add to it. Of course, there's no limit. This one here, bird beak woman. <laughs> I might even refine it even more. Who knows? So that one's still yet to be transpired, right? They're just so much fun and they're really fun to just hang on to. You can put them, you know, in a multi opened uh, opening uh, down the road. This one's really cool. It's got, you can't see it up close. If I had a good camera, I could, but you can see there's some really cool uh, surfaced uh, blossoms going on here and little cells all over. So that's a lot of fun, ink and, and gesso. And you can blow it or you can swish it. I'm not really even sure, but um Anyway, that's what I did with these. So that's that. And then what I did with this one here, this was um, 140 
and I used acrylic. This was done in acrylic on both sides of the paper, very abstract painting shape, you know, whatever, both sides. One is a little bit less, um, it's more of a, you know, mixed media background to maybe put words on top. Others are a little bit more like you can see here, this one here turned into a, you, can you see the, looks like it's in water. And then this of course looks like one of those prehistoric cave dogs. Oh man, I tell you, it's just so much fun. This on this side turned into a mountain with a bird, mountains in the background. Almost looks like a little Chinese vignette. Um, so yeah, so I mean, and then of course you get a little, you get a paper punch, right? A circular paper punch. And so these are so much fun. I will, I've got a whole bunch of these and then I will put them on their own little, little um, thing like this and carry it with me with a white gel pen and a black marker. So these are my favorite markers. I mean, I probably could go and get a thousand more of them. You know, they're all so different. The only one I don't have with me here right now is my uh, Sakura. Um, the Sakura, the, you know, the Sakura um, Microns, they're really good pens too, but I just find that uh, um, they run out of, they run out of ink. I don't know if it's just me. I'm just keep getting bad batches or what, but um, something that I'm really in love with now, because this this goes across many platforms is this identa pen. It's some um, people use it for in the, um, you know, on clothing um, or on fabric or whatever too, because uh, it's permanent. It is absolutely permanent, but it is absolutely fantastic. You can paint over it, but this is also made by Sakura. And what I like about this though, is I got double bubble. I've got a nice little fine point here. And then I got a little bit of a, thicker point here. I like the double ended. I think you get a good bang for your buck. And another one of my favorite, of course, is the brush pen. I think I showed you these before in a previous video. So the brush pen, you can get these and you just squeeze a little bit and it's refillable. So I see I've got a wayward hair there, so I'm going to probably have to cut that off. But you can go as fine. I, I'm pretty sure I did do this. So I'm not going to be leaguer this. I'm going to get right to. But these are the pens. <laughs> these are the pens I like to use. Sharpie fine. This is Sharpie, but a Sharpie fine point. This here is just to do edging. The big fat one, you know, they call it a fine point. But I, the, I'll use that for edging. This, of course, is brilliant for all kinds of things. This is the Kelly Makes. It's actually pretty good. These are the Spectrum Noirs. Of course, Tombow. Who doesn't love Tombow? And of course the Sakura Identa pen. And I use a 2B pencil for a lot of my sketching. It's it's just soft enough. And um, um, and it erases nicely too. So what I wanted to show you, so this is that one that was $5.55, and this is Cure Tacky. The the price has been going up quite a bit because, like I said, I think they're popularity now. And uh, so what I want to do is I'll just quickly show you how I go about making my little um, my little cards like this, right? So how you can kind of get almost like your value gradation there. So you come up with a, so it's really nice. And you know what's really nice about doing this sort of thing though too, is you really get a good feel for the amount of water you need to add to do those three. Like sometimes just doing those three stages is harder than doing the whole value scale just doing a three value scale on these just to show it in its very transparent, very watery state, semi water and full pigment. Okay. Cause you can even get in between these two again and in between these two again and so on and so on. But this is actually brilliant because you can see it at its lightest light and it's darkest dark is right here all on one card. So, um, yeah, you do get a good feel for how much water you need to put on your brush, especially after you do your whole palette, you've got a really nice flow. I've been back in love again with my Kalinsky Sable. I had stopped using K uh, uh, Kalinsky some time ago. I fell in love with synthetics. Um, there's some beautiful synthetics. I use the Neptune and the Princetons, the ones I have at home here that I use um, 
are these three right here. So I've got the number 10 Princeton Elite, the number 8 Princeton Long. Um, so it's called the Long Round because what happens with this is absolutely beautiful. So you can see it has the regular brush barrel. Can you see that? It has the regular brush barrel and then it's tapered off to a thinner part so you can get you can get as thin as a, a number four or three on the end of that. And then of course you do have your Kalinsky Sable. Um, these are natural hair. They hold far more water. That's why I like this for doing these because I don't have to keep getting um, more water on these. I just, I just clean out the pigment and come back in. Take the, I end up having to actually take water off. So I'll just do a real quick demo here on what I do, the proper way to do that. I got some scrap here. I've been doing a lot of play and it's just been wonderful. I almost, it's almost like I had, you know, this is worldwide timeout has um, literally been almost like a, a permission. Um, what do you call it? A permission slip from the universe for me that I could take some time off and just actually play a little bit and relax. So I see I've got some, uh, there's a color that dirtied my, wow, that's not good. One of my yellows got contaminated. Well, let's use it. It's, uh, I don't know which one that one is. It must have been on that, that um, translucent. So see how thick and heavy this is? Wow. That's pure pigment because... The pigment itself um, in the tray, like it was, I'll show you here what happened. So what happened was, is there was probably an orange on this side, which I'm thinking that suspiciously it was this. It's not the new gamboge. You can see here it's much brighter than new gamboge. So anyway, it happened. It just flopped and it's in my, my uh, Hansa Yellow medium. And so I can soak that up. I hate, I hate that. <laughs> oh, hate is a very strong word. But anyway, I got all that out of my um, brush, all that extra pigment, and I actually even ended up hitting this off on the rag again, right, coming out. And then I'm just going to kind of do this, right? I'll bring this out, feather it out. So I'm taking that from the pure pigment with clean water, and I'm dragging that over to the side here like this. And you just, you don't, with these here, I find you only have to touch it with the tip of the brush. Right, and then you can just play with that. So there you've got your mid-tone. You can bring it over if you don't like it. You can see that this is a very opaque uh, orange. I think that might be Indian yellow. Okay, and then what I did is I, I rinsed my brush out again to get rid of the pigment that was on there. Rinse my brush out again, and I dab it off. I don't get any other water and I just, I bring this over just on the edges, right? So I'm picking up that pigment and I'm adding it with the water that's already on my brush. And you got this beautiful light wash, right? I'll do it with a darker color too so you can see it darker. So let's take a Prussian, one of my favorite blues. Very dark, very beautiful. It's just vibrant, makes great, great darks, great purple. It's considered a cool. Um, that's a bit watered down, so it's not as full pigment as a cool. Well, let's put some on them so you can see it. Okay, anyway. Okay, so took all that pigment out. I'm wiping the excess off here, and now I'm just going to drag it, drag that brush over, drag that pigment with the water that's in my brush already. So you can see. So there you go. I had too much water on there. I can still see a difference, right? The darker, fuller pigment and the lighter, but there's some uh, flow going into this side, so that means this one here wasn't... Um, wasn't a dry enough application. So when you mean dry on wet, that means you got full pigment, not very watered down. So see, that's full pigment. That's better. And that's how I should have done it in the beginning. Right? See that? That's real full now. Get rid of all the pigment on my brush. Dab out the excess water. 
and then drag. There, that's better. See that? Now I'm going to get the rid of the pigment that's in the brush that I picked up from that. Get it out completely. Dab the extra water off. And then bring this over now. See? So whatever water I have in there, I don't have to add any more. There's enough in it just to do this. So you can see it is a staining color. Mind you, this is not very good quality paper. I'll, uh, this is the... Uh, uh, the sizing on this isn't correct. I don't know if it's the batch because I've had I have had some um, good success with the Artist Loft. Um, it is an artist grade level two, but I don't use it for my really good paintings anyway. I, I strictly use only arches um, when I'm doing uh, you know um, serious work you know that I want to sell. I only use arches because I know exactly how it behaves. They are consistent continuously with the quality of their paper. Um, also Strathmore 400 is, um, I've had really good results with that. I use that a lot in our classes. And also the Strath uh, Strathmore 500 series is phenomenal. Uh, very, very nice. But um, other than that, I have tried Fabriano. Not really a fan. I have tried, um, oh my gosh. Oh, the Cheap Joe's is really good. His brand of watercolor paper is very good. But since the pricing went up on the shipping, I haven't ordered anything from Cheap Joe's in years. My my late Francoise and I used to order all our su art supplies from Cheap Joe's back in the day. And then our then our dollar got so bad. And, and then the shipping was like $65 for shipping just to get a couple of tubes of paint and some paper. Pretty crazy. Anyway, so now the piece de resistance. And that is the Kohlrabi and the Kiritakis. So you're going to see when you um, when you Google in or you go to Amazon. Actually, I would just probably go to a Google page and do it. You'll probably get the Amazon results as well, though. Um, however, um, there might be other sites that will sell them a little cheaper. When I bought these last year, they were only 14 I think one was fourteen twenty four and one was fourteen ninety nine. I should have it on a piece of paper here somewhere. I had it all ready for you. I don't know where it went. Here it is. Oh, is that it? Nope. Nope. Oh well, that's the way it goes around here. Too much going on. Too many things. So anyway, um, the Komarabi. When I like when I um, first saw this. Uh, well over, I guess it'd be a year ago now when I, uh, when we were doing our Christmas cards and our fall, something like that. Anyway, it was before that I ordered it and I just loved it. I love the results, but this one here actually was supposed to be the right gold. It's very dark for me. So when I finally got these pigments in, oh my God, like seriously, just look at them. Aren't they awesome? I don't know what it is about shiny things for some of us, but the quality, I'm really impressed actually with both. So they're obviously a good quality binder in these because when these are dry, it's like I was showing you on those um, flip pages that I use, like these, these here and these. Like I was rubbing on these and everything after they were dry. There is no mica residue on my hands. I have a really super high quality fluid micas from Germany that I've had for a number of years. And we always mix stars with gum arabic and water. A lot of times we just mixed it right in with the watercolor. We never even did the gum arabic because the watercolor itself has it in it. And that back in the day was the only way I ever really used them. I, I, I didn't really understand them much. But I have so much of it even now. I didn't even realize that this is the same thing. Anyway, you live and you learn, right? doesn't matter. I have these now. So these are all removable, right? They're all got their own little and they're all numbered. And so this here is, is, um, part of, um, I think this one here. Yeah. The nine hundreds. So this is the, um, the Kiritaki here with all of these colors. And that's this one here that I got separate, but you see how dark that is compared to the rest. This one here, um, this one and this one are, are fabulous. And, and so is this one. Like those are great golds. They show up really nice on the paper. This is silver. 
and of course you've got your brass and your coppers and your dark copper. It's just fabulous. So I got them for $14.99. Do, um, do a uh, search. This is, and you'll, I've got mine right from Japan. That's why you can see this is in Japanese up here. But I think the American ones will say Gambi, uh, Basai or something like that. It's Gambi something. And, um, but mine's in Chinese or, or Japanese. And down here it says Kiritake. So K-U-R-E-T-A-K-E. -E. I don't know if you can really see that or not really well. Come on, focus. Here, tacky. And so I'm pretty, oh man, I wish I could find that paper because I wrote the prices down and what I saw them now, but you can find that yourself too. I just thought I'd save you a trip. And um, yeah, what a bummer. I have it all together. I That's the, what, that's what you get when you have too many things going on, right? It's all your fault. So now one of them, I'm not sure if it's the Kiritake or the Kamurabi. It's this one is $27 and the other one is $17. I think this one might be $17, but $5.55 just to buy them separately, you are better off getting the whole pack. Because if that's $5.55 and you go six times one, two, three, four, five, six, that's $36. So um, this by far is the better deal out of them all. And these will really, I'm sure they will go a long way. I mean, this one here is really full. You can see the, the depth of this, and it's it goes to about there. So there's a lot in there. I mean, that's probably a full tube of paint when you compare it to a watercolor tube. So you can see the thickness of it. And this is really nice, eh, because I'll actually even have them in. This one here, actually, I swap out. I'll put this in, and I take this one, and I just leave it in here when I travel and take it with me. Right? I'll just leave it in there, and it closes up beautifully with it. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, like it folds flat. I don't have any issues. Okay. So anyway, that's that. I shared that with you. It's, um, they are so much fun. Um, um, like I said, though, unfortunately the price has gone up, um, significantly on one of them, especially, I'm not, and I can't really tell you which one it is. You'll have to find that out. So this one here is the Komar, Komarebi, K-O-M-O-R-E-B-I. I'll put that down in the description, the spelling of them. I'll even give you a link to the Amazon. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't use an affiliate with them there, so I don't, uh, I don't get any kickback. But, um, but I, I do encourage you to, you know, just to Google it now that Google, Google's algorithms or algorithms are down. And I'll see you back. Come back and see some more of my fun, fun videos. I do, I do a lot of fun stuff. Um, I, I do a lot of trial and error, play with different, um, different and new, um, you know, uh, products and things like that. But anyway, thanks for coming by and I hope you're doing well through this time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye for now.